with some effort to produce fundamental decisions. It sort of leaves out the political process a little bit. Um, process for gathering information. It's a, it's a data exercise, something like a survey, right, so that you can go out and uh, uh, you know, objectify your future uh, and do analysis and think about what might happen in the, in the future. I think the futuristic thinking part is pretty good, but how does it help us understand what it is that we're actually trying to accomplish in the public sector with strategic planning? And then you know, the famous Osborne Gable, if I left them out, I mean, how could I do that? It gets into the organizational culture, and I think this is an important point. I'm not in total agreement uh, with these folks in terms of actually doing this, but certainly there are major cultural aspects to what we're trying to do. Because in essence, strategic planning in the public sector, in my view, among the things that it asks us to do, is it asks us to change organizational cultures, it asks us to change political cultures to some extent, right? and it actually asks us to be culturally relevant within the overall society that we're talking about. That is not the case in, uh, uh, in the private sector, obviously. And so we've got these three examples of what this might be, and we have 20 or 30 years experience of how this might work, but we really don't have a consistent idea that is cohesive enough and responsive enough to the political realities that gives us, at least in my view, a way to identify this. Public sector strategic planning, you know, certainly has been around for a while. Uh, I think it's fair to say that Australia, New Zealand, and probably the UK is sort of a benchmark. Um, they started first. Uh, I will argue that this grows out of new public management theory, which is a normative theory. It is a theory about what should be expressed in those terms. What would be best, given you know, some normative description of what's best. Uh, started to be adopted in the United States uh, in the 1990s. I was privileged to uh, work in the Oregon Shine State Strategic Planning process. We grew out of that. It's now widely accepted. And what I mean by that is that it's all part of being cool. <laughs> You've got to have a strategic plan or you ain't cool. Uh -huh. And that's okay, but it really doesn't get you to the place where I think the power strategic planning, power planning generally, can come into play because it becomes, as one of my colleagues here said, a checkoff box. Okay? You want the plan, here it is, now get out of my life and let me get on with what I'm actually doing. Um, you go to meetings, you go to GFOA meetings, you go to ICMA meetings, you go to any meeting you want, you go to meeting a bunch of academics who study this stuff. And if you aren't doing a strategic planning, you just ain't cool, are you? Huh? <laughs> you the, the cute girls won't go out with you. It's terrible. It's not what it was. You know? <laughs> See? Here I feel. Solved one problem already today. It, it, it becomes part of the ambiance. When I was in the uh, electric utility business back uh, when God was young and Gerber's new, uh, if you didn't have a piece of a nuclear power plant, Right, and have a little R friendly Adam symbol on your business card, you seriously were not cool. You didn't get to go on the steak dinner, dinner boat rides with the public entertainment. You know? it, 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 and what it becomes is an enthusiasm that we have. Right? It becomes something that is, and, I, and I've, I've said this in a, a lighthearted way, but it becomes something that is widely accepted, everybody uses the term, Nobody really knows what the difference means, and it becomes a social. May I feedback? It becomes a social norm, uh, as opposed to a process. So, what's the current state of the art? What do we know now that we didn't know years ago? And how are we changing strategic planning so that? 
we can more closely approximate these goals. And I say that very carefully. Right? We are not going to find the silver bullet. Okay? I neglected to bring with me the third tablet that Moses dropped on his way down the mountain that says, how to do a strategic plan in the public sector. I forgot. I left it home. All right? So I don't have that. Which leads me to the final question, and I've already told you I can't answer that one. All right? But I have some thoughts I'd like to share with you about it. Strategic planning goes on. There are strategic plans everywhere. Uh, GFOA gives awards to the Government Finance Officers Association of the United States and the International City County Managers Association of the United States give awards to having strategic plans. All right? You get nice little plaque framed, stuff like that. It's cool stuff. All right? But Moynihan, uh, right, just a couple of years ago, uh, uh, the state governments, they really are not as successful as they would like to be in implementing the management reforms. Because remember, what's the strategic plan and coming out of new public management postulates is that you'll do the plan, it will help you make decisions, and that will be implemented by managers, government managers who have discretion, significant discretion to move money around, right? to fund things that are working better, to make, perhaps improve things that are not, and things that are simply not working to cut the losses. Now, I suppose that our colleagues in Adelaide have never faced a, a committee in Congress, but they really, really like their programs. People have ownership of these things. Right? They make a difference in someone's life. They have ownership. And many of these people are outside of the strategic planning process. They are legislators. Right? They are third parties. They are stakeholders, as is some times referred to, and maybe interest groups, and others. And so enhancing managerial authority, which is one of the three legs, right, is very, very difficult. I would argue almost impossible. But yet, we still postulate that that's what's supposed to happen, and Moynihan's article is, in essence, a critique of this not happening. I know Don, uh, he was a uh, year behind me at Maxwell, and he could be somewhat didactic. Anyway, uh, the, the empirical evidence, you know, what do we know? Right? Show me that this works. Right? Real hard to come by. Real hard to come by. What is the outcome of a plan? Right? That was this cute little book. Sometimes I put it on CD now. now. But what's the outcome? How do you say, the equivalent to, here at the road department, we made 10 miles of new road. We, in the health department, inoculated 10,000 children against some disease. In the police department, we arrested all these bad guys and crime has gone down. When you have a plan, what is the outcome of the plan? It is secondary. It is secondary and therefore the empirical evidence about the efficacy of planning is not is difficult rather to empirically identify. Now I've actually got a study um, that I'm I've got rolling to try to generate some proxies for that. You know, what, what are these secondary linkages? What things happen because of plans? Uh, but the fact remains that the empirical evidence is scarce. However, I would also remind you that most people would agree that if you don't have a plan, you're planning to fail. If you don't have any idea how much money you've got in your checking account, if your essential financial management practice is, how can I be out of money I'll throw about checks, you have a problem. And yet, you can't identify it empirically especially in the public sector. Another problem, uh, my colleagues at OECD and I have been thinking about this, is, is the, the coordination between different levels of government, both and, and horizontally across the levels of government. Right? Um, 
I'm currently with the United States Commerce Department, and if you actually think that I would go over and sully myself by talking to those people of labor, you're out of your mind. <laughs> Even though we're talking about the same thing, right? We're both talking about the economic problems in Detroit and the employment issues. It's not really that serious, but there are these stovepipes, right? Set up by statute in many cases. The statutory authority which the government grants, which the legislature grants, to a particular agency is almost never considered in the context of other agencies that do similar work. And so you can wind up with anomalous results. I'll give you one example. In New Orleans, the Small Business Administration gave a loan to a business trying to recover after Hurricane Katrina. The Department of Commerce came in and also provided that same organization, that business, with some support which triggered a clause coming out of the statute of SBA and caused them to withdraw them and take the money back. Deputy Director of SBA and I had a very interesting discussion about that. But this coordination between levels of government, right, the strategic plan of the city of Pittsburgh, which I'm currently in, I would bet good money, doesn't have a whole lot to do with the strategic plan of the state. And you know what? We never even thought about you when you're doing the strategic plan in the Department of Commerce. <laughs> Although I think there is some commerce here. <laughs> so what we need, you know, one of the problems that we have one of the, is this coordination of activities. Uh, and, and then the, finally, the budget, the, the, again, the normative theory says that we should be able to have the strategic plan. We should manage against that with these kind of managerial flexibilities that, uh, that we don't have. We should manage against that, then we should measure performance, and then we should tie that to budgetary matters so that we can most efficiently use the money that government takes. And I say this advisedly, because remember, there's no exchange going on here. The way we aggregate preferences in the public sector is through the electoral systems. But in return, we don't ask people for money. As government, if you don't send me the money, unlike the Ford dealer, I will send armed people to your home, I will confiscate your money until I've got what I want. So we take this money, at least under the you know, possibility of coercion, and yet the links to these things are not well forged. And one of the reasons is fairly simple to understand. The budget process, and I, I know this is true in um, Australia, uh, it's true in the United States, it's true in every country which has a parliamentary type system of government. The legislature makes the budget. They're the ones that get to decide right, what gets funded and what doesn't. Um, and their linkage to the strategic plan, I think would be generously, perhaps heroically characterized as tenuous. Because of that, they have their own budget process. It goes on over here. So that stuff's all very nice, and send us a few of these numbers on performance, and that's all very nice. But at the end of the day, they have their own process, which does not be included in the general case, the strategic plan, strategic planning accidents, or the performance against the strategic plan. As a result, you have another ellipsis in terms of the theory and the actual practice. So what kind of challenges are we facing? I think in the future, integration. Uh, integration has got to happen across national boundaries. Strategic plans, plans which are designed by their very nature and intended to affect a region that is defined not by political boundaries, but by other types of affinities, whether they be economic, socio-political, cultural, doesn't really matter, but that area is not defined by political boundaries. I uh, recall uh, reading the uh, myth of uh, King Arthur, 
And at one point, Merlin turns the young Arthur into a hawk and it says, fly up in the air. He says, can you see the borders? Says, well, no, I can't. So how come you can see them on the ground? Says, well, they're clearly marked there. Okay. So with respect to Southeast Asia, I think, and, and I know there is a, a Mekong uh, Delta Commission, but or Mekong River Commission, but you've got a water issue that includes China, Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, probably Thailand, uh, as, in, in terms of the flows of those rivers, who uses them, that sort of thing. If you're talking about planning, both power planning, economic planning, environmental planning, social welfare, uh, that's going to have to be a supranational plan. It can't be otherwise. Otherwise, it's going to be unilateral. Mm -hmm. The national level, I think you have similar problems. You know, we, we cook up these national plans. They got one over commerce. They got one over at labor. You suppose we've ever had the one at labor? I actually had experience uh, a couple years ago when, for some reason, the Department of Energy sent us their strategic plan, which triggered alarm bells throughout the building. Because <laughs> maybe they were trying to sneak something in there. <laughs> so um, they brought the thing down to me, and they said, have one of your interns go through this and look for any mention of the Department of Commerce. <laughs> I looked at I said, you bet, no problem. He, that's always what you say to the politicals here. And, um, and I went to one of the interns and I said, um, get the PDF off the internet, you know, search through it, right, look for any commerce or any mentions, right, right, wait three days, dishevel yourself a little bit, throw some water in your face, and then walk down there with the dog ear this thing and put a couple markets if there's any place that was Pierce. But those plans are not coordinated. Subnational plans, again, city plans connecting to uh, state plans, doesn't happen. And most of the plans that I've seen, whether here in the US or in the OECD countries, have no consideration of nonprofits. And yet we rely on them for all kinds of things. But it's like they don't exist. Any of you guys ever try to do that with your wife, just kind of make decisions? <laughs> doesn't work. Doesn't work in this environment either. And then coordination, the strategic plan coordination. I've talked about this a little bit, about that between the agencies. But interactors between government agencies and non-government agencies, NGOs and others, uh, they, there needs to be some consideration, at least incorporation by reference into a strategic plan if it's going to address area conflicts. And then performance measurement. At some point, there has to be a linkage between what you're trying to do and whether you're measuring whether you're getting it or not. Otherwise, <laughs> you have no idea whether you're getting it. It's, it is a question of the linkage. And in the public sector, in my experience, and I've been doing this for what, about 20 years now, it, there is a great reluctance to measure performance because my program might look bad. You might make my program look bad. This system might make my program look bad. These are the kinds of concerns that you have. And the civil service, we, as academics, have never answered the question, what's in it for me? Don't you think that's a question I want to know the answer to? Probably so do they. And we have never communicated that. And so people, my colleague and I were talking earlier today, they, they check the box. Now, you want a plan? Sure, there's your plan. You want an analysis? Yeah, okay, get out of my life. All right, I got work, I got my real job to do. Okay? And then, with respect to the budgets, right, the budgets are policy documents. I would argue and do argue that it's probably the only real policy document. Uh, here in the US, uh, we had a president here a while ago who was the education president. But I'm not sure why. But anyway, but he wanted to have no child left behind. By golly, education was important. It was critical. Okay? It wasn't in his budget. Okay? But you say, well, wait, wait a minute, hold on, hold on. There are laws. Right? No child left behind, okay, they didn't find it. But there are laws. There are statutes. Yes, there are. In the mid-1970s, Congress passed a law that mandated that all hospitals collect information 
with respect to cancer patients. The idea being that it's aggregate would be aggregated and cancer clusters would be discovered and, and, and it might help epidemiologists you know, at least get their doctorate if not do something else. Okay? <laughs> Why don't we have that database? It's over 40 years ago. We don't have that database because in the budget document that funds HHS, there is a note and it says no funds appropriated under this title may be used mandate public law and it's gone and so hospitals have to collect this data it's all out there I don't know where probably in the storage room someplace but they have to collect it but it's not there the budget is the policy document if we don't get strategic planning into the budget decision making process we will not succeed it will be meaningless future directions in practice and I, I should say that I don't divorce theory and practice. Uh, Vern Green, the uh, methodologist uh, the, of note uh, in my program, told me that good theory has two characteristics. It has pragmatic utility. It actually helps us understand what we're observing and predict it, uh, and perhaps change it in case of public policy. And it has theoretic utility. It is abstract. It allows us to view generalized, generalized over and above the individual case that we might have been looking at. Okay? So I think first and foremost that the integration of this into the budgetary process is essential. Great idea. How would you do that? <laughs> they are the legislature after all. I think that it's a question of information. We all talk here in the states about lobbyists and what terrible people they are. And, uh, special interest groups and what horrible people they are and on balance what they're doing most of the time is providing information okay? the only people who aren't providing information is us and I have made some pilot inquiries with staff on the appropriations committee and I say the staff because the actual members of course would be talking to my boss political they and say here's some of the stuff we're thinking about in this program and here's some of the questions. Do you think those are interesting questions? Would you like the answers to those when you're having your considerations? And, and get them to buy in to that so that when you give them, not the tome, that, you know, the academics and bureaucrats are a lot alike, you know, maybe they get paid by the pound or something. Right? Um, but when you give them, you know, maybe a one page memo, right, that says, this is what we got. Right? In that context, when they have those questions in mind, then you are more likely to influence the budgetary process. And I say this advisedly. Strategic planning in the public sector is never going to be dispositive, in my opinion. It is always going to be informing the political process. Right? The aggregation of preferences, the selections of which things are important to fund, is a, ultimately a political act. What we can do is inform that decision with the best science we have because it's not going to be perfect. It's not going to be perfect, and that has to be okay because we'll get better. I think you need to have some way to coordinate, and I think this is true in, certainly in the United States, uh, it's true in, uh, in several of the OECD countries that I'm familiar with, coordinate this among the national agencies so you don't get yes you can no you mustn't uh, because those mixed signals filter down and then people spend half the time trying to figure out their way around your rules instead of how to access the programs that they need and between levels of government you know maybe here in the states we could like tell the states what we were <coughs> what we were doing until we published it you know a radical idea I grant you but still I think it has some legs and, and, and talk to them about what the kinds of things are because it, it has occurred to me that inside the ring road that runs around Washington is not the locus of all good ideas surprising to me too right? and then non-state actors I mean you've got nonprofits you've got interest groups you've got membership organizations a large number of these non-state actors that have significant influence 
They have significant influence with people in the budgetary committees. They have significant political influence. And they, too, should be informed to the extent that they can be by this. Right? And finally, uh, I think addressing culture, organizational culture, particularly important. One of the major reasons, at least in the literature I read, that strategic planning, the performance evaluation that goes along with it, does not succeed has to do with resistance from civil service. They don't want to do it. Or, okay, you made me do it, you know, now here it is, get out of my hair. Right? But they don't buy in. And it is antithetical to the organizational culture. So, okay, Bill, that's fine. You know, well, so why don't we just graduate a whole bunch of new smart kids and they'll take over and life will be good. Right? Because they will be socialized into the existing organizational culture. That's why. Hmm. And so, what we need to do, in my opinion, is to frame the question in terms of what's in it for the organization, right? And how can we fit into the organizational culture to the extent that we can, right? Because in the general case, I believe, public servants want to do a better job. They have fears, right? they have cultural motif, but they also have some ability right, to assimilate new ideas if it's appropriately framed. We have never addressed the organizational cultural issue in this context. We just don't talk about it. It's like it's not there. Um, and, and it's sort of like when you were a little kid, you know, <laughs> and you kind of, okay, they're all gone. <laughs> <laughs> It, it, it's, I was playing that game with the kid in the flight on the way out here. But after about you know four years old, it stops working. Um, like the before, I've talked about the linking the, the, these budgets back to the performance measures that somebody who's interested in this, you're giving them information they want. Uh, and how do you report this stuff to the public? You know, put out these big tomes. How many people think they read that? You know? How much of this stuff is going out to the citizenry that's on Twitter and Facebook? I, I don't, I'm not going to embarrass anyone here, but I, I go to meetings um, in Washington and other places a lot, and I say, now, how many people are on Twitter? Right? It's usually like me and one other person. You know, it's usually somebody's kid that they run with. Right? How many people have a Facebook page? I do. I mean, those communication channels right, are channels that if we don't access, then you miss a whole group of people right, who are communicating regularly to you. So I think those kinds of things are important. Um, and this business about the, the strategic and the tactical, I, I, was, I was giving a lecture once and I, I said, you know, said, why do you think that we focus so frequently on the tactical and not on the strategic? I have a backup a bit. Just, books don't ring. <laughs> you know? I, you just can't say it much better than that. But, but you have to have a strategic focus in order to actually think about a strategic plan. And while things are hunky-dory, while the economy is good, the society's rolling along, it's a good time to think about um, it's a good time to think about what you might want to do at some time in the future. And one of my one example, I, I just uh, my department was just contacted by a, a parish, as it's called, in Louisiana, and they are very, 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 very dependent on the drilling industry in the Gulf, which is not drilling right now, and they are extremely distressed about this. They're extremely distressed about this. But while they were enjoying this many years of prosperity, they never thought about, in a serious way, a strategic plan that would diversify their economy, that would subtend their society. And so now they're saying, well, people are moving out of town, and the social fabric is falling apart, and yada, yada, yada. Right. But how do we get things? segregate those things and think about strategic in the context of when things are going right. I think the way we get here is through the research. 
I think we need to do research that talks about right, how the political interface the strategic plan. How does that happen? How does it happen? How can we make it happen in different environments? I am not for a moment claiming to my friends in Adelaide that the method, the approach that I've used with appropriations committees in the United States would work in Australia. I simply don't know enough about the government to say. But I will say that I think, as a general, that getting that right is extremely important. All right? There's a list of stuff here political cultures I've mentioned, role of the civil service. Where do they fit in? And that is different country to country. I mean, in France, the civil service runs everything. Right. In the United States, I'm not sure we run anything. Right. And in places where they don't have a reformed government, they have no civil service, like Puerto Rico, right. there isn't anyone. So, you know, what's the role? And then how do we get ourselves to transcend these borders, these artificial borders. Okay? We start to see some of this. We've been encouraging it uh, uh, on my watch uh, at Commerce, and we actually have a couple where the state of Washington, the state of Oregon, separated by a river, and counties and cities on both sides in one area around the Portland metropolitan area, right? are now planning together. All right. They have transcended those borders. I, I was having a discussion with one of my colleagues uh, from uh, Canada and, at OECD, and I said, you know, you, you can't tell me that Windsor, Ontario, and Detroit <laughs> aren't tied together. I mean, they look the same. You can hardly tell the difference. It's, it, 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 but there's this border. But so what? Right. In terms of the kinds of things you need to do, right, it's, it's meaningless. Um, and then engagement and commitment. Part of the reason, I think, and a lot of the reason, that you don't get buy-in and that you face this organization of cultural resistance is because we shut people out of the process. Right? There's a few of us coneheads sit around and we come up with the strategic plan. And then we take this tome down to all these people and we go, you know, here you go. All right? and, and they, you know, some of them, take it home, they have young children, right? and they read it to them, because the kids are guaranteed to sleep eight hours, so we have a page, we'll do it. But outside of that, these things mostly get shelved. Hmm? They mostly get shelved, right? because there's no real value in strategic planning unless the people you have to have implemented want to. Right? This is the principal agent problem, right? I mean, it, it, it's, 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 it hasn't changed much. You know, we've got this great idea, you think you ought to go do it. Right? How do you get that? You get those buy-ins right, by inclusion. When we did uh, the Oregon State uh, Strategic Plan, we actually went around the state and aggregated groups in various places right, that talked to us about what they thought was important for Oregon. Right? And they come up with the Oregon Benchmarks, the State Strategic Plan, those things coming out of it. It's a pain in the butt. It takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of energy, and until our research can answer the question, what's the value, it's going to be very hard to get it done. But I think that ultimately, at the end of the day, we'll find out that it's uh, imperative if we're going to be successful. All right? um, I think that, uh, as with any research agenda, uh, the research that goes on around uh, new public management theory it, it's simplifying assumptions, right? And it's, it's, it's like the economist with the frictionless movement. We need to think about affirmatively these normative values that are infused into new public management and to strategic planning. We really don't think about it. We just, you know, this is the good, this is a good way to do it. You know, somebody said so someplace, it must be true. Right? But they're normative. Unlike our colleagues in the physical sciences, right? If I boil this water, and you boil water in Australia, as long as we can decide on which centigrade or Fahrenheit to use, we're going to get the same temperature, right? 
because we can't infuse that physical process with our normative values, with what should be, what would be better if. However, in the social sciences, and certainly in the public sector, we infuse those values constantly. It should be this way. Maybe it should. The question is, is there a way that government can actually do that? Right? And how can we conduct research that assesses those normative values? I actually did my dissertation based on an examination of normative debt management best practices, originally written down and enumerated by a gentleman named A.E. Buck in 1920, and never tested, right, enshrined in the Government Finance Officers Association debt management practices, best practices, best practices. And it turns out that none of them do much, none of them do anything except for one, which has a very, very, very small coefficient and is you know, barely significant. Right? All of those years, no one ever tested it. We need to start looking at some of those things. Um, and then I think it needs to have a sustainable orientation. We have a number of examples of how this is going on you know, and, and different definitions of what sustainable means. But a lot of what's happening uh, now is we are starting to realize that you can't just decide, well, boom, we're going to do this here and throw everybody out and trash the uh, environment without paying for it later, okay? Without paying for it later. That's what, in, in the United States, we have a thing called the EPA Superfund. Okay? The EPA Superfund cleans up really bad toxic waste sites that were created by industry. Another way to say that is they privatize the profits and socialize the costs. So I think that we need to think about how this, this orientation um, gives us some dimensions that are important that we often uh, neglect. Okay, so since you told me I had to, uh, what's it going to be? What's it going to look like? Okay, I think you're going to have horizontal and vertical integration plans. I think it's going to be informed, starting to effectively inform the budget process. Not everywhere, but I think it's going to start doing that. Uh, I think it has to. Uh, I think the uh, current economic crisis actually offers an opportunity because we can indeed offer a way to plan for that longer term horizon that will allow us to extricate ourselves, I believe. Uh, from some of the economic problems. At the same time, we build in some resilience. I think that performance measurement and program evaluation is opaque. I uh, do quite a few. I get invited uh, to do quite a few. Uh, a very popular person around Washington. And, and saw one, we had just got recently uh, wrote the report, but basically they had these um, uh, data collection buoys for weather, they float in the water, and, and they figured if, uh, if they had four sensors doing four different things on it, if one of them was working, everything was okay, all right, 100%. Well, my brother suggests that maybe they weren't using the base 10 number system. I'm not sure what's going on. <laughs> but certainly that is not giving them good feedback for their management to affect that program's performance. All right. And those buoys a tsunami warning buoys. And sooner or later, it's going to catch up. And then we'll all run around with our hair on fire. All right. Strategic plans, you know, we print them. I really think it's a mistake. <laughs> we should never, ever print anything again, ever. Because it then becomes a tome. We refer back to it. It's the course. We're going to go this way. It says so. It's written down. Must be true. Right? It's designed, the whole process is designed to be flexible, intended to be flexible and a living document. Okay? It's much like the misapplication of cost benefit analysis. Now people think they can determine what they should do instead of ranking the projects that they've got with it. It's the same situation here. We get this thing, we get this book, 
and that's it. We are, I think, faced with conditions uh, of uncertainty. I think that that's simply the nature of our world. And I think that you have to include a recognition of that. You can't plan for uncertainty, but you can include a recognition. It has to be future-oriented. Many, 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 many plans are not, right? And so strategic planning in the future is going to be future-oriented. They're going to look out 10 years and say, where do we want to be? How are we going to get there? What are we going to have done by five years to get there? What are we going to have done this year to get there? How are we going to fund it? How are we going to improve the system? And if you think about it, a lot of the things we want to do, education, health and welfare, these things don't happen this week. I mean, it's not like we, you know, Bingo and the, and the kids, you know, you've got to wait like 12, 16 years before you find out how you did. Uh, it has to be, strategic planning in the future will be much more inclusive uh, and much more comprehensive. It will span health care and housing and transportation and economic development, community development, etc. Right? It will span across those things. At least they will cross-reference each other. Right? And, it will, and it will emphasize sustainability of activities, of societies, of social contracts, and resilience in the face of uncertainty. What are you going to do if all of a sudden you can't drill for oil? Or the tide comes in, or something else happens, some other economic problem, natural disaster, or whatever. Right? How is the community going to, how is this region, how does this plan help you be more resilient to shocks of whatever kind? For instance, I was out in the uh, Midwest, I don't know, three weeks ago, four weeks ago, hard to tell, hard to remember. But we're talking to these people, and a lot of these communities, very small communities, farm communities, are being infused for the first time by large numbers of Hispanics. Right? As the farms got larger, right, the economic rationale for many of these towns went away. Didn't need a bank. Right? There's not 25, 40 farmers anymore around here. There's two. Average farm size is 160 acres, it's now millions. Uh, but what is happening is that some of these towns are getting slaughterhouses. Uh, and Hispanics are coming in to take those jobs, and it is turning these small communities upside down. Lack of resources for multilingual education.